I'm Lillian Tsang, Associate Director for Outreach and Administration at the Keller Center. Um, welcome everybody and thank you for joining today's talk. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction of James Cole. James is a Princeton alum, class of 2012, and founder of the H-Hub, a company that connects a large scale community of photographers um, with thousands of brands that need top-notch content. The ATUB is also a PSIP internship host company this year. And um, so today, he will share with us his journey from Princeton to becoming a founder of his, of his own startup and talk about four key entrepreneurial lessons. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to James. Awesome. Should I start or give it another minute for people to join or what? Um, I think I think you can go ahead. They'll they'll come in real fast now. Cool. Okay. Hi guys. I'm really excited to do this. Um, let's see. Cool. So my my talk is very vaguely titled "Am I or the Others Crazy," which hopefully was provocative and interesting and and will make sense as the as the talk goes on. Um, and I'm hoping that the bright yellow and, and the provocative title and my energy will sort of um, be interesting and, and maybe a bit different than some of the other talks that you've had. So um, the talk's about 50 minutes long and I'd love to keep questions to the end just so I can sort of get through everything. I'm happy to stay an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes over the, um, the allotted time um, for anyone that doesn't have a meeting coming up. And I'll also make my email available. I'm very eager to talk to all of you and I'm happy to answer questions via email or um, you know, set up a phone call or a Zoom after this if you have questions about your own entrepreneurial endeavors. So um, I guess I'll just get started. So first I wanna sort of ground you guys in, in who I am and sort of how I got to where I am today. Um, so I started at Princeton as all of you have. Um, I graduated in 2012. I was an art major, which I would venture none of you are um, because only two students a year are art majors. So I was an art major focusing in photography because I thought I might want to be a photographer, which is not a common path for a Princeton student. Um, and I wasn't particularly studious. I think I just didn't feel very connected to the many of the classes I was taking or my friends that were sort of aspiring to be consultants or eye bankers. Um, I did a lot of extracurriculars on campus and was very connected to um, the acapella group I was a part of and my eating club and my friends and so on. But I just, my studies never really resonated with me. And I think part of that was because the Keller Center was sort of in its infancy and I didn't have the opportunity to sort of learn about entrepreneurship, which I've come to realize is very much in line with who I am. Um, after leaving Princeton, I, again, I, I really didn't want to be a banker. I didn't want to be a consultant. I didn't want to be a lawyer as many of my friends aspired to be. Um, but I wanted to be taken seriously and do something serious and, and formidable. And so I went and worked at a very large ad agency, which for me was the wedding of sort of an intense Princeton education and, um, and my more creative sort of high energy, uh, temperament, shall we say. So I went to a big fancy ad agency called Young and Rubicam, which was impressive to my parents and their friends and anyone else who mattered. Um, and it was utterly soulless and massive and 6,000 employees and so on. And the dynamic creative experience I was hoping for was not waiting for me when I walked through those doors. Um, I did learn how to be an adult and sort of work a job and learned about advertising and sort of all the things that work about advertising and frankly, a lot of things that don't work about big advertising, which has since declined quite precipitously, I might add in the past five years. Um, after getting tired of that, I, I moved to San Francisco and just sort of wanted a change of pace. I was offered a job as head of a department. I was head of content for an app called We Heart It. We Heart It had 40 million users. Uh, for those of you who are a bit younger in the room, you might've even used it um, particularly uh, if you're a young woman, it was mostly targeted at women. And I was in charge of creating all their original content, which was very exciting for a 25 year old with a chip on his shoulder. Um, it was a terribly run company. And after about two weeks, half the company 
So 13 out of 26 employees were fired when an investor pulled their money. Um, and I sort of got a lesson in what not to do in the school of hard knocks of entrepreneurship. And um, in that chaos, which was tremendous, I, I sort of realized not, not to over glamorize it, but that I was someone who would sort of run through, sorry, run towards the, the bullets, uh, not run away from them. In other words, when the chaos mounted, I really wanted to lean in and fix things and try new things. And the entrepreneur that I think had been lying dormant beneath the surface for me for a long time really was brought to the forefront. And because of the chaos and because the leaders at the company were putting out much larger fires, I was sort of left to my own devices. Um, so all of the content I created at We Heart It on, on what became a shoestring budget really gave birth to the idea for my company. Um, so my company is The Hub. Uh, I started it in 2016 after We Heart It and, and knock on wood, you know, I'm still in business today and hope to be for quite some time. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about it on, on the next slide. Um, but I'm a first time founder. Um, it's funded by a friends and family round and we have been uh, profitable ever since. So we've sort of bootstrapped the business. I'll describe more about what that means in a minute. And where I'm going or hope to go is what I call a portfolio lifestyle, which is a very new agey San Francisco fancy way of saying the hub will sort of be the, the keystone, shall we say. It will be the core uh, aspect of what I do and how I spend my time, but I hope to indeed you know, put my fingers in other pies, touch other businesses, take other opportunities. So already in the past year, I've sort of uh, acquired equity stakes in three or four or five other businesses and I'm either a formal advisor or in some cases even more involved 20 hours a month, 30 hours a month, that sort of thing as a, as a CMO, uh, chief marketing officer. Um, I serve on boards and I, you know, want to be more involved in, in what Princeton is doing, uh, which wasn't around when I was in school um, with entrepreneurship. Um, so I really want to have the hub as sort of the, the key brick in, in the house, shall we say, but everything else um, around it. Um, I plan to sort of build an ad and, and create a real portfolio of things that switch me on. So let me quickly tell you about my company and then I'll tell you about, oh, it's not progressing these slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'll tell you about my company, The Hub, and then I'd love to sort of impart a few lessons I've learned from four years of entrepreneurship and going down just about every false alley and uh, you know every, every dead end you can imagine. So hopefully I have some, some lessons to impart so that you don't step in the same potholes I did. Um, so The Hub connects brands, uh, mostly food and beverage brands, to a network of 39,000 highly vetted photographers and videographers all over the country. So we've had 200,000 people apply, we've accepted almost 40,000, um, and we connect those photographers and videographers to brands um, in two ways. So I'm just gonna click on this quickly and take you to our website. For the sake of time, I'm gonna sort of go through this very quickly, but I encourage you if you're interested in, in what it is that we do at the Hub to sort of check out the website. It's the hub.com. Um, the first H is because we are the shape of connection. I don't know if you guys can see me right now, but uh, we connect brands on one side to creators on the other, and we are the cross beam or bridge in between them. Um, so again, people can come onto our website um, they can post a job saying that they need 20 photos against a blue backdrop or with a blonde model with freckles uh, holding a surfboard on a beach um, and the client's product. And then our photographers all over the country uh, shoot content. And so we've shot for massive companies like, um, you know, Kashi and Del Monte and uh, Campbell's. Um, and then lots and lots and lots of small companies, some of which you guys have heard, you know, Goldfish, some of which you guys have heard of like Harmless Harvest or Hint, but then also a lot of the sort of up and coming companies of tomorrow that you've never heard of um, that you hopefully soon will if we do our job well. Um, so literally thousands and thousands of shoots, tens of thousands of photographers and lots of movement in between amazing food and beverage brands of tomorrow and really, really talented photographers from Cincinnati to Minneapolis to Denver to Jacksonville, Florida to New York City. Um, so that's sort of the, the idea of the hub. Um, 
when you build a two-sided marketplace, which is the type of business the hub is because we have photographers on one side of the marketplace and brands on the other, conventional wisdom is you have to start with one side of the marketplace. So I spent the first two years and almost all of our money growing a community of photographers with no way of monetizing it. So we had dinner parties and trips and gallery shows and meetups and literally over 500 events in two years. So I've met thousands and thousands and thousands of photographers in major cities across the United States. I would fly all over the place. I would meet these people, shake their hands, get to know them. Uh, we made, I think 20,000 pink hats, which you can see in that photo on the left there. Um, Shannon, uh, my co-founder, uh, always yells at me because I think we have 6,000 still in a warehouse somewhere. Um, but suffice it to say, a very robust, active, happy, dynamic community of really talented young people. You guys, being young yourselves, know that everyone's a photographer nowadays. Everyone has an Instagram with 12,000 followers. But this is sort of the, the upper echelon of that culture, if you will. So 39,000 people, 10,000 of whom are active every month, 400,000 shoots have happened between them, meaning photographers have uh, reached out to models on our platform or models have reached out to videographers on our platform. And it's sort of a social network of sorts on the supply side. And then the demand side, which we've only built really in the past year and a half, shall we say, um, is, is are these brands, right? That come in and post jobs wanting to hire the best photographers in the country. Um, and we make money in two ways. The first way we make money, again, I came from an agency background, so I started an agency. It would be like if Uber had started as a limo company or Airbnb had started as a travel agency. I started my demand side, basically reaching out to brands and saying, I know all the best photographers, pay me $100,000 and I'll go get 10 of them and we'll create all your content for the next three months. So we started as an agency and to this day still have agency clients. Kashi pays us almost a hundred grand a year to create content for them. Uh, and then we break the, the work up into little pieces and give it to photographers. Um, and then the second way is through a software platform. So again, brands can come and they post jobs much like you would on Upwork or Fiverr, if you guys are familiar with those platforms or Airbnb or Uber, you know, you describe what it is that you want and very quickly someone on the other side of the, the platform will respond. Brands receive 10 to 20 bids from photographers within 24 hours. So it's incredibly active and brands tell us all the time, like I'm overwhelmed. I almost have too many choices. Like there's so much talent. Um, and that's because we created this really dynamic community before letting the brands in. Um, as I said, thousands of brands have hired creators um, and they're able to do so better faster and cheaper than anywhere else. Conventional wisdom is that you're not able to have all three of those things. You either are better, but more expensive or you're faster, but cheaper. Um, but we're all three. Uh, we're, the quality of the work is I think incredibly, incredibly high thanks to the caliber of photographers that we've been able to attract. Um, we're faster, you know, by, a margin of say 5x uh, as compared to a production studio or agency of old and we're cheaper sometimes by a zero as compared to all the time brands will come to us and say i, I paid you know seven grand for my last shoot and then they'll pay 750 dollars for their shoot on the hub uh, and be happier with the result so it really is like why would you call a limo company when uber exists why would you stay in a you know, a fancy hotel when an amazing Airbnb is up the road. It's the same sort of logic. Um, I really, my, the founder of We Heart It, or sorry, the CEO of We Heart It was very opaque about the numbers. And so there was a huge fall from grace when half the company was fired and no one saw it coming. And learning from that and being a very transparent person by nature i am very open with my team about exactly what we have in the bank and exactly what we're making i think that's incredibly important and so by extension though i can't see your faces or know any of you personally i'd like to be very honest during this talk about where we're at from a dollar um, perspective and how that's affected my psyche over the course of the the lifetime of the company so um We've raised $1.7 million um, from friends and family. That is an enormous friends and family round. 
Friends and family is usually a, so that the first money you raise sort of to prototype your business, it's 20 K from a rich uncle or 5 K from a couple friends each or something like that. 1.7 million is outrageous. Um, I was lucky enough to have many friends and family involved and some of them write fairly large checks. Um, there were a lot of bad things that came about from that that I'll describe in a minute. Um, but we basically have been funded as a friends and family business, but we look sort of like a venture backed business because the friends and family round was so very large. Um, thereafter, we've been profitable um, only in the last three or four months, shall we say, but we're bootstrapping the business, which is a fancy way of saying growing it only with the profits from the business itself, not using investor money to uh, sort of fund future growth. Um, most of the businesses you guys know and venerate and think are awesome, Uber, Airbnb, Allbirds, you name it, um, Casper Mattresses, one of the co-founders went to Princeton, all of those businesses are losing money hand over fist. Uber lost over 10 billion with a B dollars last year. So all of those companies, though they may be, you know, six, seven, eight years old, though they're bringing in billions of dollars in revenue, gross revenue, they lose much more than that. And they're propped up by VC dollars. And another conversation for another day is, in my opinion, VC, you know, particularly in Silicon Valley has lost the script. It's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, you know, you raise money. Um, you are 40 cents of every dollar, guys, 40 cents of every dollar that you raise from a VC go to Facebook, Amazon, and Google, which is a fancy way of saying almost all the money that is raised from VC goes to user acquisition from big platforms. And almost all of that user acquisition is not profitable. And so all of these companies are growing like a weed, but acquiring customers in a non-profitable way. They use that growth to impress the next investor who then invests more money and then they spend more money on acquisition and the cycle repeats itself until they're spending billions of dollars a year acquiring customers and losing billions more. Um, and I found myself in that cycle and found it wasn't sustainable, which I'll talk a bit, a bit more about in a second, um, but it's quite insidious. And so I would, I would be wary if you're about to start a company of, you know, the almighty, you know, $10 million valuation that seems very sexy. Uh, we've done $2 million in gross revenue to date. So a small company by some standards, but I'm proud of the fact that we're not just an idea. We actually make money um, and we'll do almost a million dollars in gross revenue this year, which is cool. Okay, so as I said, you know, six months ago, guys, last January, six months ago, I was spending $180,000 running my business. I had 15 employees and I was bringing in 40K a month in, in revenue. So my net, in net revenue, I should say. So um, in other words, after paying the creators, that's what we took home. That means that I was losing 140K a month so a very fancy car or a somewhat modest house was being purchased every month on my credit card. Um, and even though the company was moving forward and good things were happening, it's really hard to go to bed at night looking at your bank account when you're torching 5K a day. And if you have a day that's sort of inefficient or you weren't quite on your game or you stayed out a bit late the night before, $5,000 the next day, you know, it's really hard to stomach. Um, and for some reasons that I'll explain in a minute, it just wasn't tenable, guys. Like trying to be the next $100 million company, trying to play this game and achieve what they call escape velocity and get out of this death spiral of raising money, losing money, raising money, losing money. It, it just, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. So we basically transformed the business. We went from 15 employees to three. Uh, we went from having a nice, fancy office in Brooklyn, New York to no office before COVID. Um, and now certainly no office during COVID. Uh, we now spend $31,000 a month and we're profitable. So it's a much more modest business, but it's growing profitably and it's working. And I feel much more fulfilled and connected to the business that I'm running instead of feeling enslaved by it. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions on that dynamic, but I've been inside a hyper growth tech company and I've been inside a bootstrapped grow modestly company. 
And those are very different entities. And you should think about what business you want to start um, if, if you're planning on starting one. So again, just to, just to involve you guys and to make sure you guys aren't asleep yet, does anyone know what this is? Lillian, I'm gonna count on you to jump in if, if a student doesn't in the next four seconds. It's a mirage. Thank you, so much enthusiasm. Um, it is a mirage. A mirage, for those of you who don't know, is when something is on the horizon in the desert and you're very thirsty and you think there might be an oasis and water if you only just go an another 10 miles, say. And then you get there and a mirage is definitionally sort of a, a figment of your imagination. It's something that isn't actually there. And so too is, is the life of a founder, right? You think that you're going to hit some sort of metric uh, and impress someone, but the goalposts keep moving. So, you know, I'm pounding this point a little hard, but beware the mirage, beware the, the goalposts because they do in fact shift. So I'm going to leave you with three very quick lessons and then focus on a fourth, which I think is the seminal lesson I've learned. It has informed both my life as an entrepreneur, but also just my life as a human being. Um, I know that sounds rather grandiose, but, um, and you can tell me afterwards if you agree. Um, but my, my hope is to impart some entrepreneurial wisdom, but also just to leave you with something to better yourself as a human as you walk out of this talk today. So what are the three quick lessons? Uh, first, start slow and cheap. I told you I raised $1.7 million. And as you can probably tell from my temperament on this little talk, I have a lot of energy, a lot of ideas, a lot of enthusiasm. And so when I started my company, I had abounding potential energy. So much was built up behind the dam, shall we say. The, the idea was sort of lying in wait for months and months. And when it was finally let out of the cage, it leapt out into the world. Um, the analogy I often give here is golf, which if you know me, which none of you do, is laughable because I've played golf four times in my life, which is sort of the point. If you've never played golf or you've played golf a couple times, you take the driver, the, the biggest club, and you step up to the ball and you hit it. And even if you hit it kind of medium or, or softly, shall we say, the, um, the ball goes flying. Like, it's amazing. Um, and if you're even off by 1% or 2% in how you've positioned the face of the club, the ball will go 50 yards, 100 yards, you know, 300 yards in the wrong direction off of the trajectory you were hoping for. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs step up to the ball. They think they're going to hit a hole in one. And most entrepreneurs don't have $1.7 million behind their swing. But if you swing with that kind of money and that kind of uh, exuberance, you can end up like in the woods, just so far away from, from the goal, from, from the hole that you're trying to hit the ball into. And so the first year or two or three of the company, I brought so much energy and I put so much money to work that I ended up sort of very much off target. So my advice to you would be MVP, MVP, MVP. MVP stands for minimum viable product. Google it or read about it if you don't know what it is. But the general concept is how can you start as modestly, as simply, as, as in, in as concise a format as possible? How can you test your ideas and sort of modestly iterate uh, as opposed to thinking that your idea is in fact a hole in one because almost never does that happen. And when you're, the idea leaves your brain and enters the market, it often drops like a lead balloon. Um, so be prepared to go out modestly and iterate your idea um, slowly and conscientiously. Um, the second one is team and talent are everything. I think a couple members of my team are, are on the phone right now, so I hope this makes them blush a little bit. But just to put a random number on it, if you don't give away 60% of your company, which is a totally random number, but maybe it will make it stick in your mind. If you don't give 60% of your company away in the first year, you're doing it very, very wrong. The friends and family money I raised, I raised through a safe. You guys probably aren't aware of what that is and I don't have the time to explain it, but the upshot is that I actually haven't given any equity away yet. I will at a future date, but for now I own 96% of my business four years in. 
the employee who owns the most equity has 3% and she has bled for me. Um, and many of you might think that's a good thing because if I'm able to sell this thing for a lot of money, I will make a lot of money. But it's actually a terrible thing. And the reason why is because I used money in the beginning as the currency of choice to entice people to be involved in the project, whether they were employees or you know, consultants or whatever else. And you attract the wrong kind of talent when you pay people market value or above market value for an early idea. Um, you really do want to find a co-founder who balances out your temperament. You really do want to find those early employees that really, really believe and are willing to work for 10 or 20 or 30% below market rate because they get two or three or four points in your company, uh, percentage points that is. Um, and so if you don't have good people around you, you lose. And I would go a step further and say, if you don't have good people around you that are deeply bought into what you are doing, um, you lose as well and you'll feel very alone. Um, the last point I'll make on this is a company very quickly resembles you. It's a personification of your ethos and soul. And I was the sole founder of my company. And very quickly, my company became me. And as we all are imperfect, I certainly am, your company is, right? And you realize, oh my gosh, there are massive holes in how we're doing this. And if only I had someone who was good at X or good at Y. Um, and you really wanna surround yourself with those people quite quickly. The last thing is to say no and to tighten your focus, which is ironic because I've been rambling for five minutes on these points. Um, I probably should have had two points on this slide and not three. In the beginning, I went too wide. I said yes to too many things. A quick example is we have an app, a, a native app for the iPhone for creators to meet up with one another, a social media app. And it's used very heavily, but it is not core to our business. It is not a revenue driver. And I was warned by people I trust not to bring such a thing into the world because once you do, it must be fed. And I have many, many, many animals lying around my menagerie, shall we say, that need to be fed, ideas like that one. And they're not bad ideas so much as I spend a lot of my day feeding things that perhaps should ne never have been brought into the world in the first place. And so you either have to kill off aspects of your business, which is quite painful at some point, or continue to feed things, which is quite inefficient and expensive. So say no, tighten your focus, make a to-do list, scratch off 80% of it every day, kill your babies. The tighter your focus, the better, almost always. Okay, the fourth lesson. If you took a nap for the last 10 minutes, I don't blame you, but now would be a good time to wake up. Beware the critics on the other side of the swinging doors. Does anyone know what doors these are? They're kitchen doors in a restaurant. These are kitchen doors in a restaurant. That sounds like the last gentleman, and I'm going to just go full, um, fully honest here and say that's Michael, who's one of my interns this summer. So next time, it will not be Michael. It will be someone else, please. Um, yes, but it's true. These are kitchen doors. And what these do, um, for those of you who don't know or haven't worked in a kitchen or been to a restaurant ever, <laughs> Uh, these separate the kitchen from the, the dining area from where the patrons sit, right? And these simple little doors that swing back and forth um, separate utter chaos, flames, pork chops being dropped on the floor, cursing chefs, and so on, from perfectly civilized, sophisticated dining uh, where patrons are paying like $36 for that very pork chop, say, that was just dropped on the floor in the kitchen. Um, and so there are two entirely different worlds and the founder of a company has to cross that threshold a lot. You have to go into the kitchen where there are fires and there are people that are mad and there are chefs that are threatening to quit and there's undercooked food and there are all kinds of problems, always. And then you have to go to the front of the house and smile and pretend that everything's okay when everything isn't okay and sell to customers. Um, or to investors, which is what the next allegory is about. So as you may recall, I was burning a small house a month 
and I realized that my friends and family might not want to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars again. So I decided it was high time that I do what normal entrepreneurs do and raise from venture capitalists. So I went to some venture capitalists and I said, I have this amazing company. We have all these creators. We're making a lot of money as an agency. We have a software that is buggy, but we're about to launch a new version of it. Are you interested in investing and, and what more would I have to do for you to sign a check with me? And this was a year ago today, July of 2019. And they said, and no one's, they didn't mince words. They said, here are things that you could do. Um, and you know, we'd be very interested. Um, and I had some great meetings. So they said, drop the agency, that thing that's making you a lot of money and you're working for Kashi and a bunch of other big brands and making, you know, over hundred K a month in gross revenue. Don't do that because it's not scalable. In other words, this will never be in a hundred million dollar or billion dollar company. It will be a $10 million cute little ad agency and we don't want to invest in that sort of business. So get rid of that. Okay. Scale the platform. You say you have this buggy version of the platform. You just brought in world-class engineers. I think I saw one of them on this call. Actually, his name is Jason and he's a absolute godsend. Um, you're about to build a state-of-the-art version of the platform, sort of a V2, shall we say. Scale it. Show us that it works. Get 100 brands to pay money and to go through the platform end-to-end -end and actually get their images back. And better yet, grow 5% week over week. So every week, I want five more transactions than the week prior after you launch this new version. And if you guys are familiar with Y Combinator, they actually use five to seven as the definition of viral growth. So if you're growing five to 7% week over week, you, you've sort of hit a, a critical threshold of, of you know, a hockey stick, shall we say. So do this and we'll invest, fine. So I go back into the kitchen and I say, guys, it's gonna be a really hard three months, but we're gonna do it and, and I know what to do. We, you know, we have a very simple formula and we will succeed. And so my, my guys, my, my you know, chefs in the kitchen worked their asses off. I actually had one of my best employees quit over this period of time. Jason, who's on the phone, almost murdered me. And we're really, really close friends to this day, but he, um, he was not a happy camper trying to get this out on time and, and make it work on time. Um, but in, in the ensuing months after this conversation, I did what they said. I killed the agency. So we were doing $126,000 of gross revenue in July and by November, 21,000. So I literally just fired clients and completely murdered my ad agency. And then I grew the platform, not 5% week over week, but as a screw you to investors, I grew 10% week over week because who does that? That's like something out of, a, out of the Facebook movie or something like that. So literally in, in four months, guys, 642% growth, 10% week over week growth. Like that's viral, viral growth. And I was so ready to go and bring my ball tip pen and sign the documents with all these fancy investors and be in tech crunch for, you know, being the next big thing in, in content, right? I'm going to very briefly go through this slide because I'm conscious of time here, guys. I'm happy to explain this more later. If someone said to you, you have to gain 5% more weight every month, you could probably do it in the beginning by eating really healthy foods and working out in the gym every day and so forth for a month or two. But quite quickly, to hit that kind of growth, you'd have to just start stuffing your face with peanut butter and whole milk and pizza and donuts and you know not leaving your bed and you do unhealthy things when you have to grow in unhealthy ways. And that's what this slide is all about. It's a bit confusing, but quickly, if you look at September, the middle, the middle column here, um, I was paying $59 to get people to post jobs, but to get them to complete jobs, only one out of 20 people were completing jobs because the platform was new and unoptimized. And so we were paying $1,200 to get someone to complete a transaction. And if you look at the key down below, a transaction at the time was making me about 120 bucks. So I was paying 1200 bucks to make 120 bucks. And uh, I, I didn't excel in my mathematics courses at Princeton, but even I know that paying $12 to make $1 is probably not a great idea. So we we tightened the platform very quickly and overnight, you know, the next month, October, 
we're paying $5 to make $1. Still terrible, but much better. In May of the ensuing year, so seven or eight months later, we were paying $2 to make $1. Now we're paying about $1 to make $1. So breaking even on our growth. So I sold my soul and spent a, sh uh, a, a sorry, Lillian told me I can't be myself and use four letter words. So I used a ton of money to grow very, very quickly. Um, and it was ill-advised. I took all of this though, shall we, you know, I, I did everything, right? I hit all the goals. I did exactly what they told me to do. And I listened very carefully. And I went to 34 investors. And these were the emails that I got in November after four months of superlative growth. And I got, out of 34 meetings, I got 34 no's. And I thought some of the no's would come from this because they'd say this is unscalable, this is unsustainable, this is unhealthy. But none of them even got that far. Like they didn't do diligence to look under the hood and realize that my growth was super unhealthy. They just, they just straight up said no. And this slide is meant to be overwhelming. Like you can't really read these. I'm happy to share this later if you guys would like to read what it feels like to have your head put in a vice by 34 uh, investors. But um, yeah, it was overwhelming and sort of humbling and like, how can my company be doing well and how can I be growing like this and have 34 out of 34 people tell me that it's not going to work. And so I, I bring you to the, the, the title of this talk, am I or the others crazy? The question that makes me hazy, am I or the others crazy? It's an Einstein quote. And of course, Einstein wasn't crazy, but is viewed as sort of one of the seminal geniuses of the 20th century. But he just as easily could have been a madman, right? And entrepreneurs walk this tightrope daily. And then certainly at moments like this, where it's like, if 34 people are telling you something, you probably should listen. So I'm probably crazy. Um, but then on the other hand, maybe I'm not, and maybe they're all just missing it. And entrepreneurs have to have a little bit of crazy. You have to believe in yourself in a way that's verging on ill-advised to get out of bed every morning and push this boulder, you know, the Sisyphean journey where every day you push a boulder up a hill and it feels like you're not getting anywhere. Um, so I really like meditated on this guys. Like, is it me? Is it them? I thought about shutting down the company. I thought about selling the company. I started the process of selling the company. Um, and so I, yeah, I started the, the process of selling the company and, and really tightened costs and, and started getting ready to get rid of the damn thing. Um, and in that process, I also really just started reflecting a lot on our journey and maybe saying goodbye to this company and what that meant. This photo is also going to get me in trouble with Lillian, but um, this is from two months after we became an LLC. Um, I started the company and quickly thereafter, three young photographers, Ja'Cory, Zach, and Miguel joined the company. And I paid them two fifty dollars a week out of my personal you know, checking account. And I paid myself nothing. And we sat around my dining room table in my tiny apartment in the Mission District of San Francisco. And it was what startups are sold to you as, which is like, we believed. We were a tight team. We bled for the company. Jacory and Miguel on, on the left and right, respectively, they lived an hour and a half away and would wake up at 4.30 to beat traffic to get to my house every day for $250 a week. You know, we were working 15 hour days. We just loved what we were doing and thought it was going to change the world. And it was as advertised, you know, we all really drank the Kool-Aid and it was scrappy. Um, and so when we went to New York for our first client meetings, a couple, a couple months in, um, I took them to um, the charging bull on wall street, which is kind of a cool place. If you guys haven't been, it's in New York city. It's right near the stock exchange. It's this huge bull. And if you rub the bull's testicles, it's meant to bring you sort of capitalist success in your endeavors. Um, so I took them to the sort of eye of the capitalist storm um, as sort of a morale booster and like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to we're going to be in the trenches for a while, but we're going to get there. Um, and so I sort of reflected on this moment and how it was sad and maybe I was wrong and I let them down and we won't get there. So. In my process of selling the company, guys, I, I deployed what's called the CEO technique, cut, earn, and owe. You cut costs, 
you earn more money and you call out the people you owe money to and you renegotiate. So I cut costs from 180 of burn a month to 31, which involved going from 15 to three employees, getting rid of an office, everything in between. I earned more money. So I got more agency clients back and generated revenue. And I called companies, mostly software companies like MailChimp or other entities that help us sort of build our business. Uh, and I renegotiated. Uh, COVID had hit at this point, and so I, I'm not embarrassed to admit that I sort of used that a, a bit as air cover, and, and they were amenable to cutting us deals and letting us out of contracts, and I was able to get costs down. So through that, again, overnight, 180 a burn to, to 31,000 in burn in a, pa- in a span of five or six months, um, and then again, quite quickly was able to make the, the company profitable from losing a house every month. So just totally different, right? So what is the hub about now and, and where am I going and, and what is my final lesson and, and takeaway for you guys? Grow sustainably and grow with integrity. So this is what this looks like mathematically and I'm sensitive to time here. So I'm going to move quite quickly on this. Uh, I might lean on my dear friend, Michael, to, to help the group through this one because it's a little bit, a little bit of a, um, an exercise I'm going to take you guys through. So this uh, formula is the key to entrepreneurial success and to life. This formula is the key to entrepreneurial success and to life. Lifetime value, LTV, divided by customer acquisition cost is greater than or equal to one. What does that mean? It means the, the money that a customer pays you over her lifetime needs to be greater than the money you paid to acquire her, to get her as a customer in the first place i.e. be profitable. Very simple. To raise a series A, that number needs to be three, not one. Let's say we were starting a chocolate ice cream shop in Princeton, New Jersey, because we've decided that somehow Halo Pub and Ben Spoon and Thomas Sweet have missed the, missed the boat and we're going to really corner the market on chocolate ice cream. We could do it in two ways, right? So let's say Michael Uh, who I've been working with all summer, and I had two different ideas, right? And I made uh, the top row, and and Michael made the bottom row. So my version of the company is, Michael, we're going to plaster flyers all over Frist and all over town, Witherspoon Street, Nassau Street, you name it. Best ice cream in town. It's going to have pictures of ice cream cones, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. It's going to be great. And Michael's like, okay, I'm going to make flyers too, but my flyers are going to be they're going to say best chocolate in town with four chocolate ice cream cones. So on opening day, and these are sort of quantum realities, guys. So in other words, option A or option B, right? They're not both occurring. So if we did it my way, 100 customers will come to the shop on the opening day. They'll see the flyers and they'll come. So we've spent $10 per customer, right? Because we spent $1,000 and 100 came. And we'll sell 100 ice cream cones. Ice cream cones are two bucks a pop. So we made $200 of gross revenue. We're still in the whole 800 bucks, guys. But it's only opening day, so that's okay. But in the ensuing weeks, if we were to pay attention to these exact 100 customers and how happy they were with the experience, only an average of six sales will happen a day for the ensuing weeks from those 100 customers, that initial cohort, which will yield to $228 in sales. So we still are operating at a deficit, okay? And in Michael's situation, 53 people will come a day on average, and that will do $2,000 in incremental sales. So now we've done $2,200 in sales and we are a profitable business. Michael, or someone else, let's give someone else a chance. And if, if no one pipes up, then, then Michael, I'm gonna lean on you. So why would Michael's flyer yield more people coming back day after day after day than my flyer? We did have something submitted to the chat um, from Sophie. She wrote, no false advertising, assuming you're only selling chocolate. Indeed. So false advertising is, is a bit uh, litigious or, or inflammatory, shall we say. But yes, the, the principle is right, which is that people came and they were anticipating vanilla 
and they were anticipating strawberry. And then they were very disappointed when we only had chocolate. So it would make sense that those people would never come back again, right? Because they were promised something and we didn't deliver. And I'm giving a dramatic example, but there are more subtle versions of this. When you launch your company, you describe it in a way people come and it doesn't live up to their expectations. In Michael's scenario, he leaned into the fact that we're chocolate, 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 chocolate. And so a lot of people came back. This is what it looks like graphically. So in my shop on the first day, a hundred people came, same as Michael, but on the second day, only 40 came in my shop, the pink, the light pink on the fifth day, 10 people on the seventh day, three people. And by the ninth day, zero of the initial hundred came back. So we spent a thousand dollars getting these people guys. And after the 10th day, none of them come back ever, 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 ever again. And so we could get a, a hundred more people, but the same thing's going to happen. In Michael's case, 48 people on day 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so on. There's an asymptote. They come back again and again and again and again. So someone, Sophie, Michael, anyone, if we were to on day a hundred of being in business, walk into our shop and look some woman in the eye and say, Hey, Jennifer, you've been here like 30 times. We've only been open three months. Why? What might Jennifer say? What's a plausible reason why Jennifer would have come 30 times to our shop instead of say, Hey, low pub. All right, you're on, Michael. Um, so she might say that she likes the price the best or that she really likes that you put chocolate chips in the ice cream or she likes how creamy it is, something like that. Totally. So we've done some market research. We talk to our passionate customers, people that come back a lot, and we figure out, like, what is it about our chocolate? Like, Halo has chocolate and, and Thomas Sweet has chocolate. Like, why did you come here? Why are you coming here all the time? And she's like, well, like Michael said, you know, Chocolate chips, they're, you have amazing, like the, I can tell they're like really high quality and organic and, and uh, they almost taste like, you know, are they fair trade? Like they're really, really good. And we ask a few other people and they confirm as much. And, and so if we were to do another round of flyers, guys, perhaps now instead of just saying best chocolate in town, we'd say best chocolate in town, fair trade chocolate chips from South America. And what do you think would happen to our asymptote if we got a hundred more people to come? Do you think more of them would be pleased or fewer of them would be pleased? Sophie had submitted to the chat uh, more. I love you, Sophie. Thank you. Yes, more. That's the answer. So the idea is like, how can we get this line higher and higher? And when people talk about product market fit, if you have an asymptote at all, because every industry and business is different, some will asymptote at 10, some at 30, some at 50, some over different time horizons. But the punchline is, if people are coming back again and again and again, you're doing something right. And if you can learn from those people about what it is that you're doing right, and then talk about that more, you'll get more of those people and you'll do right by more people. And so the asymptote, the line will get higher and higher and higher and more and more people will be pleased and be loyal customers. And so this idea guys of lifetime value over customer acquisition cost, we're still spending the same amount acquiring them, but people are sticking around longer, thereby making that ratio greater and greater and greater, right? And that's the key to growing a business. And I'll go so far guys as to say, it's the key to growing a business. Identify who you are. We're a chocolate ice cream shop. Refine who you are. We're a chocolate ice cream shop with chocolate chips that are fair trade from you know, Nicaragua. And then find people who really love who we are. So if we have you know, chocolate chips sourced from South America, maybe we put our flyers around East Pine because that's where a lot of Spanish classes are and students that are interested in South America will see it. Or maybe, um, you know, um, maybe people that live on a certain side of Nassau street prefer, um, chocolate ice cream than uh, people that live on Witherspoon street. So we'll, we'll put our flyers up there. So you can really try to only advertise to those people who may have interest in your product, not to everyone because you cannot please everyone. Right. And I think it's the same with life, right? If you, 
if you figure out who you are, just to give a quick fun Princeton example, like the girl I dated in college, I, I'm a skinny, you, get, you guys can't see me, but I'm a scrawny, you know, high energy, creative, you know, somewhat nerdy guy. And I dated a girl who was in cottage. And every time I'd go over there at two in the morning to, to you know, meet up with her, um, she'd be talking to some huge athletic guy. And I would always sort of wonder, is that what she wants? You know, and I'd go to the gym and I'd work out and try to get bigger and stronger and try to mirror what I thought she wanted. And naturally that relationship ended, right? Um, I wasn't right for her and she wasn't right for me. Um, I think once you identify who it is that you are and you own that, um, you feel comfortable in that narrative and in, in that identity, you refine it. And then you find only those people who really truly um, align with that identity. That's the key to finding a romantic partner. That's the key to finding lifelong friends. Um, it's the key to finding sort of happiness in life, I think. Um, and it's also the key to finding success as a business as well. Um, so hopefully that's helpful in your entrepreneurial and personal journeys. So the epilogue, and then I'll answer questions in what few minutes we have remaining. We've identified who we are. We make photographs and videos, <laughs> but mostly photographs. And we do it not for uh, headshots, not for engagement photos, not for wedding shots, which we used to do all of. We do food and beverage shots and we do them really, really, really well. That's what we do. And we tightened the company and are profitable and are only speaking to these companies and working with these companies and cornering this market. We've gone from mostly tiny companies. The largest client we had for a long time was Rise Brewing Co, which I highly recommend. It's an awesome group of founders. They're great, but they did 5 million in last year in revenue. Takashi being our biggest client, which is 30 million a year in revenue, to now talking to Mars, who you know owns every uh, candy bar you've ever eaten, and did 35 billion last year in revenue. Um, so we're starting to get noticed by by the giants of of the food industry, which is really exciting. And m best of all, and what I'm most proud of is you know we've sort of come back to this basic fundamental truth of like believing in what you do in coming to work every day and working for yourself and, and, and owning the company and not having the company own you, being beholden to no one um, and feeling completely liberated, empowered and supercharged by your existence. Like, I love what I do. I have not taken a day off in 30 days and I am so energized by that. Um, Michael, who, who I'll share this, I hope it's okay. Michael, our, our, our intern this summer has shared that, right? He's been working through the weekends. He's not paid anymore for doing that, but he is just finding the work energizing. Shannon, who's, who's my co-founder now um, in the photo here on the right, um, same thing, right? We all love what we do and we feel connected to it um, and feel that it aligns with who we are as people and vice versa. Um, and so I wish that for all of you in your entrepreneurial journey and, and in your uh, personal journey as well. Um, so I'll answer any questions now. And then, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to stick around um, for anyone who wants to stick around. Um, and then I'll make myself widely available. You know, I'll, I'll have someone send out a Calendly link and you guys can get time on my calendar um, for anyone that wants to sort of talk in a more private setting or a, an elongated setting. Um, so anyway, thank you for listening. And, and uh, please, any questions? I'm very transparent, so you can ask me anything. Thank you. And yeah, just a reminder, everyone, you can either submit it to the chat um, or you do have control of your microphone, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself as well. So much power. Well, if um, no one is going to submit any questions, um, they can send any follow-ons directly to you, right? Oh, we Without do have a doubt. question. Here we go, here we go. Try to focus more. Sorry, I, I didn't have my chat open. Okay, so, so Emma asked, did the VCs explain why they didn't invest? Yes, lots of muddy answers, Emma. When I tried to sell the company, I, sold, I, I, I almost sold to... Um, to competitors and they really saw the nuances of our business. VCs are industry agnostic largely, or, or they might 
In other words, they might have met with a, a pet food company right before me and a Ayurvedic medicine supplement company right after and so on. And so some of them said we've made our bets in this space and they didn't want to make another bet. Some of them said the space is so highly fractured and there's so much dust being kicked up in the air by influencer marketing, if you guys know what that is, that they didn't want to take a bet in the space yet. Um, some of them, I think some of them just wanted to see more data. They wanted more time. Uh, some of them gave sort of weak watered down answers. It was frustrating. You know, I think people don't want to hurt your feelings and it's so important to get clean feedback and maybe it was me, but I, I felt as though the feedback I got was sort of walking on eggshells in a lot of cases and wasn't particularly helpful or formative. Um, so that process was frustrating and also sort of a dead end in terms of what do I need to fix, which is why I sort of abandoned the, the whole thing. How do you think your prints and experience prepared you for your entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey? Is there anything you would have done differently in retrospect? Um, I think, you know, as I said, I, I, this is probably quite unbecoming, but in the interest of transparency, like I, I really didn't get an, a Princeton education or at least not with a capital E, um, which is to say like, I picked easy classes. I didn't do a thesis because I was in the visual arts department and I did a, a photography thesis. Um, you know, I would skip lectures, you know, I, I didn't learn as much as I could have. And sometimes I regret that. Other times I'm a massive extrovert and I had a very, very diverse group of friends on campus. I lived with the track team. I was in Ivy. I was in an acapella group. Um, I was a photographer around campus. That actually was a huge unlock for me because I met all these different groups because a dance group would need photos. Like, so I shot for DZAC or I would shoot for a cappella group or a sports team or you name it. So I think what it did is it really taught me to relate to a lot of people, take inputs and ideas from a lot of people, be dynamic and sort of um, flexible and open to new ways of thinking. Um, I think that's probably what prepared me the most. I think you guys have it made in so far as like I've said to Lillian many times, she, not only is the fact that this exists, like PSIP or the Keller Center more broadly, um, but I think the, the leadership there truly is doing an amazing job. Um, I don't really blow smoke as a person. So you guys are very lucky to have access to people like Lillian and to have access to businesses like the ones you do. Um, I didn't have that. I think if I had, I probably would have gone into entrepreneurship much sooner and found this path much sooner as well. Um, what are the long-term plans for the company IPO getting acquired? I listen, I think people used to say this to me in the early days. Like if you are talking about getting acquired a year or two into starting a business, it's like, it's pretty tacky. And I, and I kind of got it, but I never really got it. And now that I've been in it for four years, I really get it, which is to say, if you're in it to get out, like, why are you in it, man? You know, like there's no there's this trick investors do where they ask you what you're going to do if it doesn't work out. Like what's your backup plan. And if you have a prepared answer for that, like, Oh, well, I can always go back. They won't invest is, is how the story goes. They don't want you to have a backup plan. Burn the ships. When Cortez came to the new world, he knew that his men might be a little bit risk averse and have, have second thoughts and might want to sail back to Spain. So he torched his ships the first night, burn your ships, man. So for me, like, I'm not looking to sell. I'm not looking to uh, IPO. I'm looking for this lifestyle business. I'm looking for a sustainable, like, how can this business throw off, you know, 100K, 200K into my pocket? I don't pay myself still. So how can that happen? How can I be involved in other businesses? How can I mentor someone like whoever asked that question? Um, how can I live a life that energizes me every day and feel connected to what I'm doing? And, you know, some of the photographers that are on this call right now that I invited from our community that are some of our top people, I've had very tearful conversations with some of them where they were able to quit their job. You know, I, I won't betray any trust, but they had a job and they quit it so that they could be a photographer or they were able to support their family at a rough time. Um, so I find a lot of meaning in what I do and I don't, 
I, I have no designs to give that up. Um, and like, if money were what it was all about, I would have just, you know, the money that I've invested personally, I would have just kept it and, and like worked a normal job like anyone else. Um, can you speak more about the intersection of your company and the influencer marketing space you just spoke about? Um, we're coming up on time here. I'm, I'm, I will go all day. You guys stay as long as you want. The next question is how important do you think accelerators, incubators are for startup? I'm going to answer that first before people leave because the influencer marketing questions very niche and it's a little bit more complicated. Be very wary of accelerators and incubators. I've, I've found them to be very predatory. Um, a lot of them take equity when you sign on the dotted line. And they say, we will offer you the moon and connect you to all these people and you'll come to all these happy hours. And when you're a startup founder, you're like, you know, frantic, you feel like you're drowning all the time. And so when someone says that they're going to, you know, welcome you aboard their cruise liner and they're all these people that you can hobnob with, it feels like Nirvana, you know, it's like I'm being rescued finally, but very rarely is it, I've actually left, I've been invited into two very um, exclusive incubators and I left both of them uh, one after two months and one after three and got all my equity back. Both of them were bait and switches where the big hobnobby guys or gals would promise me the moon and then they'd toss me to people that didn't know anything or actually even more insidious is the big hobnobby people. They might've sold a company for 50 million bucks or a hundred million bucks like 20 years ago, but they haven't been in the trenches in a while and they don't really want to be. And so when you call them and you're really scared about a really important little wrinkle in your company, they either don't have the answer or don't have the, the time to particularly care or help. So I would say find people who are willing to bleed and get in the trenches with you and fight back to back. You don't really want people above that promise you some sort of elusive if it feels like it's a hole in one, it's, it's not going to work. You should operate under that assumption um, and then be surprised when you, when you do get lucky. Um, influencer marketing. I wrote an article before we were in LLC about how influencer marketing was going to fail, um, which I'm very proud of because it was a thing that none of you would have heard of back then. And it, I just could see how broken it was. Really quick, the way media works, guys, is there's something that holds consumer attention, like a radio program, and then brands advertise and siphon that attention. And then consumer eyeballs move to TV, and then the brands follow. And then they go to the internet, and then banner ads. And, and, and the eyeballs are moving away from the brands ruining the party. And so content is bastardized by advertising and so it goes and influencer marketing is a tale as old as time social media is where you went to look at your friends posts and then what happened is your friends became influencers and those influencers started started shilling products to you and you became mistrustful of them you guys are probably too young to remember the shoot the ducks and win an ipad banner ads or Congrats, you've won a free iPad. But those banner ads worked for a while until they didn't and they don't exist anymore for a reason. Influencer marketing worked for a hot second too. And I could rattle off 10 companies. Daniel Wellington is a great case study for those of you who don't know. Daniel Wellington went from $100,000 in sales when I bought my first Daniel Wellington watch to 100 million in three years on the backs of influencers. And in this was the glory days of influencer marketing. And I know many of the heroes of influ I know, I know the woman who started influencer marketing it's at New York city is her Instagram handle. And she started the agency that basically put it on the map. Uh, her name is Liz Eiswine, if you want to Google her. Um, but within, it was dead in the water within six months, one year, uh, it's, it's insidious and predatory and, um, it doesn't work. Um, and I'm happy to talk at great length that anyone who's interested in it, um, we had it as a, a sort of a menu item for what we offered on the platform and then really zeroed in on the photography thing, maybe a year and a half ago, um, and took all anything related to followings and social media and using 
the photographer's images on their own Instagram completely off the table because um, I just don't believe in it. Um, any final questions? There are 28 of you remaining. I'm very happy to keep answering questions truly. Um, so please don't be shy or not. You can enter them in the chat. You can also turn off your microphone and, and yell into the mic. If um, I, I'm seeing some of our photographers on here, I see you, Jason. Jason is um, our lead developer. Um, so if you guys have questions, like this might be a different side of the company that you haven't seen before. Um, not you, Jason, but maybe the photographers. So if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Has COVID-19 impacted your future plans for your business? Absolutely. Like real quick, I remember was torching cash. I thought it was failing. And I'm like, I got to get rid of this business. Actually, really quick, right before I was about to try to sell the business, the band Good Charlotte, which some of you are too young to remember, but some of you will know very well, um, reached out to me. And I thought it was too good to be true. And next thing I know, I'm on a video chat with, with, you know, Joel and Benji, who are like the, the two brothers that started Good Charlotte. And they flew me out to LA and I, they were going to invest. And so I thought that was going to be my saving grace. But long story short, I was prepared to sell. And I was sitting right here at this desk. I came home because uh, Brooklyn, where I live, was getting hit really hard. And I had a call with one of the buyers that uh, they raised 250 million bucks at a billion dollar valuation. And buying me for a million or two dollars would have been, you know, easy peasy. And they were very close and another company had had six or seven conversations with. And they said, let's just see how this COVID thing shakes out. And then naturally the billion dollar business, I think will go out of business and the other one will be fine. But if they were to acquire me, it'll be in six months or a year. But when they're finally ready, they thought they were going to get me for a cool million bucks and I wouldn't sell for less than 20 million now. My company's not worth anything close to 20 million, but that's how much I'm enjoying it. So if someone wanted to pay that, I'd, I'd consider it, but otherwise no way in hell. So what did COVID do? I was waving the white flag, begging for someone to rescue me. I would have sold this company for 200K if someone had offered it, right? I was done. Uh, I didn't think I could fix it. 34 investors said, no, I'm a failure. I'm crazy. I just want to get my exit, get some money say that I didn't completely fail and get the hell out. And COVID said, not on our watch. Um, so I'm not embarrassed to admit that I was, um, I was tapping, I was tapping out, you know, I was done. Um, it took me two or three months to come to peace with that and really feel comfortable with that decision. But I did. And I was ready to say goodbye. Um, and COVID made me stay in the game. Um, and then I guess the easier, less dramatic answer is, we luckily chose food and Bev about a year ago and food and beverage has done quite well in COVID because people still need food and Bev. So um, my business has done better in COVID um, is the short of it. Do you have any advice for people who are interested in entrepreneurship, but still uncertain about their career path? Absolutely. Um, two or three things. One intern for me. <laughs> or someone like me, right? Like find some, some business that you think is pretty cool and stick your nose in it. And one of two things will happen. You'll have the experience I did, which is that it was a complete disaster. And I learned so, like so much of my leadership style, so much of how I built this business was just inverting what we hard it did. Like that was a dumpster fire. So I guess I'll just do the opposite. Um, or you'll be quite inspired and you'll learn a lot you know, I am balding aggressively. I have huge bags under my eyes. I don't sleep very well. I have aged 10 years in four physically. Um, but I've, I truly believe that I've learned 10 or 15 years of, of business acumen, life acumen, dealing with people, de you know, Jason and I had a lot of tension, uh, the, the developer I mentioned, um, who's still on this call, you know, we were at each other's throats for the first three months we were working together. I'm a consummate extrovert and very, you know, creative and right brained. And he's a, you know, a full stack developer, but a backend specialist, left brained, very logical. 
lots of tension and we've become incredibly close and respect each other immensely. Um, and so you learn so much is the point. And so my advice to you would be put yourself in a position to learn that much, even if it's on a six month time horizon, if you're not sure about what to do, just try it. Um, I think that would be my advice. Just, just try, be willing to work for cheap, be willing to put some skin in the game, um, be willing to fail and you'll learn a ton. Um, and it will be very informative and you'll be like, you know, for me guys, this is like the drug, you know, like I will not retire ever. Like until I cannot physically work, I will be doing something like this. I've never felt more alive or more in touch with who I am as a person than, um, I have grown to be through this company. Um, and so it'll either be like that where it's like, Oh my, who turned the lights on? Um, or you'll realize it's not for you and then go get a job at Goldman Sachs. Um, cool. Yeah. That was what Tiffany said. Okay. Anything else? This, this slow trickle is very dramatic. Well, I do want to jump in for a second, James, and because uh, I know some students um, still need to get to some team meetings. And oh, please, yeah. So if you guys can stay on, great. Um, if you do have meetings to get to, um, I don't want you to just feel like you have to hang in 